We are in Hampton County, South Carolina at Gooding Cemetery to find the grave of Stephen Smith. Stephen Smith was killed back in 2015. Originally, this case was closed back then. Police said it was a hit and run accident, but now the case has been reopened. We're gonna tell you more about it and we're gonna show you his grave, pay our respects, and we cordially invite you to come along. Hampton County, now, one where's your emergency? Hell, uh, I just going down the wrong Crockettville Road. Mm -hmm. I see somebody laying out. Okay, all right, we'll get an officer headed out that way to see what's going on. Okay, they just uh, leave this road, I ain't, uh, I ain't moving or nothing like that, but uh, somebody's going to hit him, it's dark. Uh-huh. Somebody's going to hit him. All right, we'll get an officer headed out that way. Okay. All right, sir. Stephen Smith's cousin Connie said he was a remarkable young man. Stephen was amazing. He was a light. He was not going to absorb your bad mood. He was going to make you be in a good mood. He was absolutely, as his mom said, he was a clown. He was, he was really a light for our family. His infectious personality, his bubbly spirit, his sense of humor. I love how he, how he radiated. He really did. That's what makes this whole thing so tragic. When investigators spoke to Stephen's twin sister, Stephanie, she told them he did start acting a little out of character when the summer of 2015 arrived. In high school, he was kind of open and friends with everybody, but he didn't have, you know, like a best friend. And of course, I was always there. Right. When he got into college, the first semester, he was acting normal. And then when he started doing summer classes, that's when he started acting a little funny. And, um, and when you say funny, he started coming home late. His mother, Sandy, agreed. Over the past couple of weeks, did you notice anything strange about his actions or anything that seemed to be bothering him? Anything that you just uh, feel like, you know, that, um, you know, that, that as a mother, you know, get that mother's intuition that there was something bothering him or that, you know, he was having any... Um, And would you? He even didn't go to school. He played hooky from school, and he never missed school. Was he telling you where he was hanging out or what what he was doing? No. Um. Well, my mom said he started going over to her house. He would skip school some days and go to her house and okay. stay there until two or three o'clock in the morning. Stephen was openly gay. Family members say he was using dating websites and posting ads on Craigslist, trying to find men to hang out with. Stephanie said she had warned him to be careful. Was he trying to meet people on, on these accounts? In other words, like a dating website. Um, he would. It was more of a friend thing. Uh -huh. He didn't really want anything, you know, too close and personal with these people. He just wanted somebody to talk to, and that's how he talked to all these people. On July 8th, 2015, Stephen Smith was found dead in the middle of the road between four and five in the morning. We're on Sandy Run Road, kind of in the middle of nowhere. This is rural Hampton County, South Carolina. His body would have been found right out here, right smack in the middle of the road. Now, he only had a couple injuries. One was a head injury, and the other one was a dislocated shoulder. Also, there was nothing found out here to indicate any kind of an accident with a vehicle. There were no skid marks, and there was no debris of any kind at the spot where his body was found. The first officers to arrive here were deputies from the Hampton County Sheriff's Department. In an incident report written by one of those deputies, it states, I spotted a person laying in the middle of Sandy Run. The person was a white young male with a severe head wound. After inspecting the body, it appears the victim had been shot. An EMS worker stated that a projectile wound was located on the victim's head. Other notes say, a hole in the skull was located above the victim's right eye. Not long after that, a South Carolina Highway Patrol officer arrived at the scene. A report written by that officer stated, the victim was found in the middle of Sandy Run Road, deceased from some sort of blunt force trauma to the head. I saw no vehicle debris, skid marks, or injuries consistent with someone being struck by a vehicle. The shoes were loosely tied and both were still on. After consulting with MATE, which is the Multidisciplinary Accident Investigation, we see no evidence to suggest the victim was struck by a vehicle. There is no car parts, no any type of uh, 
uh, parts to a car or a truck or any other vehicle. Um, does not appear to be, in my opinion, uh, uh, struck by a vehicle, uh, possibly something else. Uh, if it was struck by a vehicle, very low speed, but his injuries are pertain to his head area. Uh, uh, I believe the coroner stated it was uh, blunt, uh, blunt force trauma. In a different report written by a mate officer who arrived at the scene sometime after 5.30 that morning, the officer said he was told about a possible hit and run fatality. But when he arrived at the scene, he was told by Hampton County Coroner Ernie Washington this was a homicide. The officer wrote in his report, he pointed out the wound to be a gunshot wound and showed me the entry point. Assistant Coroner Kelly Green then began to show me photographs they took, again pointing to the entry point to the head and also a defensive wound to the hand. The officer adds, I asked for clarity if they were sure it was a homicide and their response was yes. Former state trooper Todd Proctor was a lead investigator at the scene with Mate. At that point, you know, I'd been in law enforcement on the highway patrol for, you know, 15 years. Um, I've worked several collisions, hit and run collisions. Um, nothing about this case from the very beginning um, pointed towards it being a hit and run. As any investigator, you go off of the evidence. Um, there was no evidence that, that you know, pointed towards this being a hit and run or a vehicle even being involved in it. Um, it looked like it was more staged, um, like possibly the body had been placed in the roadway. Mate investigates traffic accidents and traffic fatalities. They do not investigate murders. Since officers were convinced this wasn't a traffic accident, the case was handed over to the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division, also called SLED. Proctor said, so SLED came out to the scene and processed the scene and the vehicle and all that kind of stuff. The Hampton County Sheriff Department sent the body to a pathologist at the Medical University of South Carolina. The pathologist was a lady by the name of Dr. Susan E. Presnell. She performed an autopsy and determined the cause of death to be blunt head trauma sustained in a motor vehicle crash. The pathologist stated there was no gunshot wound and perhaps a side view mirror of a semi truck struck Smith causing his head injury. At that point, the mate unit had to be brought back into the case since it was now a hit and run. It had been several days, so Proctor and his unit had to start gathering and going through evidence and pictures from the scene. Proctor wrote in a report on July 22, 2015, he went to meet with Dr. Presnell. Proctor stated Presnell talked to him in a, quote, negative tone. Presnell told him she determined it was a hit and run because Smith was found in the road. Proctor mentioned to her, Smith's loosely tied shoes were still on his feet when his body was found, and then asked her whether it was possible someone holding a baseball bat could have struck Smith from a vehicle as it drove past him. He stated Presnell told him as he was leaving that the report was preliminary and it was his job to figure out what it was that struck Smith, not hers. The next month, which was August of 2015, Proctor talked to the Hampton County Coroner, Ernie Washington, writing in the report. He faxed me a copy of the report and told me that he does not agree with the pathologist stating that the victim was struck by a motor vehicle. The pathologist also states in the report, that in light of historical information, along with the autopsy, these conclusions were made. To what historical information she possessed, I am unaware. Smith's car was found about three miles away from here with the gas cap hanging down. Police assumed he ran out of gas and started walking. In his vehicle, Sandy found a gate pass to a man's home with the man's name on it. She contacted the man through Facebook and was able to speak to him, and later the police did as well. So I responded to it, and um, and so he met me one, well, I guess it was evening of June 28th, but she was pretty understanding of it. And then um, I said, well, you know, were you aware that he had placed, you know, some Craigslist ads? You know, because there's crazy people out there. I'm, 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 I'm a very really nice person, and, you know, um, I would never do any harm to anybody. Um, but, just, but that, you know, I know there are some crazy people out there, so now I think it's, it's, a, it's a remote possibility that, it might be somehow related to, you know, another similar, you know, Craigslist encounter and, you know, but not everybody likes, 
his sexual orientation. After Stephen's death, a man by the name of Mark Bickhart showed up claiming to have been Stephen's boyfriend. Conversation that y'all were having, what was the conversation y'all were talking about? Just normal boyfriend and, and boyfriend talk. Have y'all been arguing prior to that? I wouldn't say an argument, it was just, um, I put, I seen his, um, his Craigslist and it was, mainly what it was, was he put it up there to show me, and I told him I wasn't seeing anybody. And I said, somebody's screwing around with my Craigslist. I said, because they should all be down. I says, I killed all my stuff once, once, once we got serious about it, we were about to get, ma we were going to get married. Family members say they had never heard anything about Mark. Did he have any type of boyfriends or anything like that? Steven's never had a relationship. That's one thing that got me when this guy said I'm his boyfriend because he's not Steven's type. Okay. And, you know, when this guy's like, I'm his boyfriend, I'm just like, uh, no, you're more of a sugar daddy. And he got mad at me for saying that. But there was one name that kept coming up more than any other. And who was that? And then that's pretty much all I heard. I did hear names, and I'm, um, or heard a name, and that name was, he goes by Buster Murdoch. just track down because you are now the tenth person that I talked to in reference to this in reference to this one rumor and it had to it had to start somewhere. You know, somebody had to, had to generate it. Eventually I'm gonna get to the source, I hope. Hampton's a small place. Uh, somebody knows something and as long as as long as we can keep people talking, somebody's bound to slip up and say something. You know a lot of people seem a little nervous to say the name Murdoch. Uh, yeah, and, and you know, I, I understand that they're uh, pretty big down there in Hampton, but um, I'm out of Charleston, and that name doesn't mean anything to me. So I, I want you to feel, you know, like you don't have anything to worry about, okay? I, I want you to understand that. You're going to hear all kind of rumors, you know, just because Stephen was gay. I said, but I don't see any reason why they would, any reason they would have to you know, harm Stephen. But then later on, it just kept coming up, Murdoch's, Murdoch's, Murdoch's. And then everything was just like swept under the rug, all misplaced evidence. And so then that just got me to thinking, well, maybe they did have something to do with it. Some of the evidence she claims went missing include the rape kit, DNA from under Stephen's fingernails, and clothing he had on at the time. One of the tips investigators got was that Alex Murdoch's son, Buster, had been in a relationship with Stephen. They were apparently friends at one point in time and former classmates at school. The information that was first given to me was that um, Buster Murdoch and maybe one or two other people had were out that night and they had sold Stephen's car or whatever, so they went down a road and they actually saw him walking and they were gonna kinda like play they were gonna kinda like play around with him and they held something or swung something out of the car and accidentally hit him. Eventually the investigation hit a brick wall. Then, about six years later in June of twenty twenty one, a nine one one call came in from a distraught man by the name of Alex Murdoch. Forty one forty seven Moselle Road, I've been up to it now, it's bad. Okay. Okay, and are they breathing? No, ma'am. Okay, and you said it's your wife and your son? My wife and my son. Are they in a vehicle? No, ma'am, they're on the ground out at my kennel. Murdoch's wife Maggie and son Paul had been murdered at the family property about 15 miles from where Smith had been found. Shortly after the murder, SLED announced it was opening its own investigation into the death of Stephen Smith. Law Enforcement Division spokesman Tommy Crosby released a statement saying, SLED has opened an investigation into the death of Stephen Smith 
based upon information gathered during the course of the double murder investigation of Paul and Maggie Murdoch. SLED did not share any other details explaining what new information had been found. Stephen's mom, Sandy, never thought her son had been killed in a hit and run. When she heard the news of the new investigation, she said, I was so happy. I couldn't even cry for hours. I was in shock. She also said, I know Stephen. He would not have been in that road. He had his phone on him. He would have called. Back in 2015, she told a newspaper reporter, one of the guys that supposedly did this, Stephen told his twin sister that he had a fling with the boy. He also told me that he and the boy had a deep sea fishing trip planned for July. Stephen died on the 8th of July. It doesn't matter what his sexual preferences were. He was still my son. I guarantee you that Stephen was not in that road. They took him from his car. Everybody knew his car because he had the ugliest little banana car in town. These boys were coming from a baseball game, and I think that they were right behind him. So when he had to pull over, they were right there. The worst part is that some of the individuals responsible were Stephen's classmates. Just go ahead and, and tell me you know, what you heard. Yes, and not a problem. Um, first heard, just like everybody else in our little small town, that he was, first we heard he was shot. Then we heard it was a hit and run, but recently, probably a week ago, week and a half ago, I'd say something like that, um, I heard that these two, maybe three young men were in a vehicle. Um, they were riding down 601, saw the car on the side of the road, I guess saw the boy walking. Um, they turned back around. I guess they were attempting to, I don't want to say you know, mess around with him or something like that and stuck something out the window and it, you know, hit him in, I don't know if it hit him in the head or the back or where it hit him. Um, and then that's pretty much all I heard. I did hear names and I'm, um, or heard a name and that name was, he goes by Buster Murdoch. Also found in police notes is the fact investigators at one point got an anonymous email tip saying, Dontario, Aiken, along with another black male and another white male, Murdoch, are the ones involved in the death. Investigators spoke with Aiken. This is Lance Corporal, J.D. James, South Carolina, the Fort Patrol Summit Unit. Did he say how he died? Uh, so I said he got hit by a car or something. That's what, that's what you heard? Yeah. He didn't get hit by a car. Did he? Uh, uh, I don't know. And someone murdered him. That's what I'm saying. For what? Why would somebody do that to him? I have no idea. But he wasn't talking to nobody, I don't think. Because he was out when I played football. He was out training. I mean, too much problems in life. Too much I've never seen talk. Too much. The investigator made a note. Mr. Aiken said he was not friends with any Murdoch subjects on Facebook. I later looked on Facebook and saw the subject is friends on Facebook with Buster Murdoch. The investigator got back in touch with Aiken and asked why he lied about this, to which he stated he never hangs out with him or went to any parties hosted by the Murdoch's subjects. One other strange tip also came in. This one was on December 18th by a man who said his stepson knew the name of a local guy who struck and killed Stephen Smith. The man who called in the tip then went silent and wouldn't answer calls from investigators. Finally, he told them the reason he was passing this information on was because Randy Murdoch told him to call. Randy is Alex Murdoch's brother, so he's Paul and Buster's uncle. The day that Stephen passed away, uh, Randy Murdoch was the second person to call my dad after the coroner, and he said he wanted to take the case and it would be free of charge and everything. And my dad's a little iffy on that. Sandy says her son was funny. He was hilarious. He was just a ray of sunshine when he walked into a room. He was always smiling, loved books, wanted to be a doctor. Stephen graduated from Wade Hampton High School in 2014 as a straight A student. He was studying nursing at Orangeburg Calhoun Tech. He was actually returning from a night class when he was killed. His yearbook picture has a favorite quote next to it which says, you can have all the money in the world but one thing you will never have is a dinosaur, Homer Simpson, most likely to become a medical physician or rule the world. 
A visitor at Stephen's grave was upset to see Stephen doesn't have a headstone. The visitor was able to get in touch with Sandy, and they started a fundraiser through Steedley Monument Works to get a headstone for Stephen. Sandy says, it means a lot. It means the world, that they're still loving and caring people in this world, and I'm grateful for all that they are doing. Sandy and Stephen's twin sister have been working on the design for the headstone. Sandy says, he loved the beach, so we're going to do like a beach scene and then have his picture on there. She said he would feel really good about it, saying, I'm going to tell you what he would say. You would do that for me? If you can make a donation for Stephen's headstone, please call Steedley Monument Works at 843-538-8103 or visit their website, which we will link below.